Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This podcast is brought to you by the demons in my head, the angels who told me I should do this podcast, and all the signed and unsigned permission release forms from everyone I mentioned in this podcast. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, and the upcoming book murder there's an app for that all based on my fantastical crazy life you can listen to the serial podcast version of novel one and novel two here at the mafia hairdresser chronicles and wherever you listen to chronicles and wherever you listen to podcasts and both the books and the hit podcast along with this one how i killed my mother are available at mafiahairdresser.com. and now on with this episode of how i killed my mother This one's called Misty McMichael, Heart of Gold. I first met Misty McMichael when she came into my private Mafia hairdresser salon suite on Walton Street in the Gold Coast of Chicago. Misty just happens to be the wife of Steve McMichael otherwise known as Mongo McMichael or Ming the Merciless. Steve is a legend in Chicago, as well as all of North America. He played defensive tackle for the Super Bowl XX champion Chicago Bears in 1986. Chicago Bears in 1986. After football, Steve went on to tackle a new career, and that was as a wrestling champion. He was a one-time WCW U.S. champion, as well as a member of the famous Four Horsemen in that body-slamming sport. Misty first met Steve on a Sunday night after an exceptionally exhausting week of dancing for strangers at the Pearl Oyster Bar in Austin, Texas, the town where she had lived in in her early 20s. All Misty wanted to do that night was just go out and just have some fun after work and be near people, but not necessarily be in the center of attention. In fact, she used what she called her resting bitch face as she leaned over her drink at the bar as if doing these things or actions were her social distancing social distancing tools at the time. As Misty nursed her lemon drop shots with sugar on the rim, she wondered if she would ever find true love. And yet she was so over men. She married a bad man once and dated others who were less than ideal. And in the Pearl Oyster, Misty also began to review her life with the men that she had chosen in the past, and she made a list of never agains. Misty knew that she never again wanted to be with a man who had hurt her. Misty also never again wanted to be with a man who would take her money. And as she made her never again list in her mind, Misty pondered what traits she would like or maybe like to put down on a list of what she might want in a man. Alas, she had found it hard to find line items to put in her want column in her mind that night. Had she ever dated or been with a good night out alone in the crowd, she took a last sip of her sugary golden drink and Misty prayed. Maybe, no, she didn't pray. Maybe it was more of a wish, she told me. She wished, or prayed, to no particular divine entity at all. She just thought to herself, bigly, Misty wished that she would meet a good man, a man that she could love and adore. She wanted a man that could take care of her and a man that would appreciate what she could do for him. And she felt good about that wish. And she knew that she could take care of that same man who would take care of her. So much that she remembered that wish and the thoughts of that give and take relationship. And she just thought it was the most important thing that she had ever wished or prayed for in her whole entire life. Because for the night. So she set down her little empty lemon drop glass and decided to leave the bar. 
But before she could stand and move towards the exit, in walked a six foot two inches hunk of a man. That's what she told me. He had sunglasses on his head to hold back long dark hair that reached down to his waist. And he sauntered into the bar and he swaggered. That hunk of a man entered that bar like he knew everyone in there was expecting him to walk through that door. And they expected to see a king. And he obliged by acting kingly. Holy crap, she said to herself. Who the fuck is that? Misty was interested. But Misty was also tired, and it was late, and the hunk looked like trouble. Trouble was not on the good list. But Misty was also tired, and it was late, and the hunk looked like trouble. Trouble was not on the good list. So... She turned her back to him and decided that she also needed to wish that she would cease being attracted to bad boys. But the king walked in and sat right on the very bar stool that was sitting right next to Misty. And Misty was startled. What the fuck, she said under her breath, noticing his cowboy boots. Steve McMichael got right into her face and said, I don't know what you think but you can't have me. Adrenaline, shock, and a lifetime of being hit on by men helped Misty quickly adjourn her weary thoughts, her fatigue, and prayers, and she snapped at the man. Who said I wanted you? Period. Then Misty ordered Steve a drink from the bartender, a lemon drop with sugar on the rim. And then silently, he sipped his drink. And then he returned the favor and had the bartender make her the same drink, only it did not have sugar on the rim. And then they began to talk, but only after she told him he ordered her drink wrong. Whatever they talked about that night, it was the perfect spark because Misty and Steve have rarely been apart since that fateful night on March 24th in 1998. They got engaged on March 24th in 1999 in Venice, Italy, and they got married on March 24th, 2001. And they had a good, if not exciting life together until on April 23rd, 2021, Steve announced on TV that he would, from that day on, be fighting ALS in private, away from the public eye. He told his fans that he had been living with ALS and had been fighting the good fight for his fans, but it was then time to leave the spotlight. Misty told me that after his diagnosis of ALS and up to the time he retired from the public eye, she believes Steve was able to fight this disease so well because of the inspiration and the spiritual support from his fans, because of the inspiration and the spiritual support from his fans and friends and the teammates, his family, as well as his NFL, WWF, ESPN, and his Chicago WGN-TV associates. She said he rarely broke down, surrendered, or expressed remorse for anything. He was a trooper, and he took on the disease gracefully and with dignity. When one is first diagnosed with ALS, the doctors will tell you that you will probably only live two and a half to five years. In the old days, when Lou Gehrig was diagnosed, doctors gave the patients hope by telling them it was possible to live much longer. But on the aside, doctors would tell the truth to the family and the friends who would be taking care of the ALS patient. Both Steve and Misty had been given the full truth of their situation when Steve was diagnosed and fumbling. But from then on, Steve's ALS had a wicked and speedy progression, and Misty only wished someone could have told her how hard it was going to be for the two of them. In the time I got to know Misty, Steve also had lost his use of his legs, his breath, and his speech. All that was left was his eyeballs, and in time, he wouldn't be able to move those lids of his as well. It only took two and a half years for this and all of that to happen to Steve. 
The celebrity couple um, was struck with surprise and horror at the hundreds and thousands of dollars of medical bills that quickly became too much to handle. And when Steve became too sick to take care of the family finances, Misty had to learn to become an accountant, a businesswoman, and an insurance expert. With ALS, one must learn a lot of time, or you'll go broke very fast. And your ALS patients will die sooner than later if you don't learn what you need to, to know. They call ALS the poor man's disease because most families who have a member affected by it, they will likely go broke. At the very least, they'll have to file for bankruptcy at one point. And the longer your money lasts, the longer the patient will live. (laughs) When Misty first started dating Steve, she thought he was an out of work and broke dude. She told her daddy that she had probably already fallen in love with another penniless man whom she was going to have to support again, just like her first husband. When she first met Steve, he had just broken his arm and he had simply told her that he was taking a break from his work. What he neglected to tell her was that he was one of the 1985-86 Chicago Bears. And at the time, he was a WWF superstar wrestler. While he was still on his break, Misty was working for her ex-husband's brother, who owned a stripogram service. Since he had time on his hands, Steve offered to go with Misty on a few gigs, where his official job at those gigs would be what Misty called a cooler, which means he was her bodyguard. Misty thought he was so sweet for offering to be um, her cooler because Steve was the first guy who didn't charge her anything to do that for her. The first call was a regular stripogram job. Uh, the guy she was going to entertain was retiring and leaving his place of employment. So his workmates, um, they chipped in for a stripogram for him at his company. And it was an easy gig. One or two quick songs, wiggle wiggle. That little show wasn't, wasn't so bad for Steve, she thought, especially since everyone at the place seemed to like him. She had no idea why, other than he was always very charismatic. And then there was another gig where she had to, um, to strip a ground for a bunch of men who were deaf. There were about 10 guys and it was at one of the guy's personal homes. Now, the thing about stripping and dancing for a bunch of deaf guys, other than the fact that the music was just for her, was the fact that they grunt and growl because they can't hear themselves. They didn't mean to be indiscreet. You see, hearing guys may want to make those noises, but they usually didn't because they wouldn't want to sound creepy in front of their friends, and maybe they also didn't want to freak out the strippers. But when she was performing her act for the deaf men, it wasn't just their grunts that made Misty to feel uncomfortable. It was the fact that they were also signing to to each other, you know, using their hands to speak. And they were doing it a lot. And the entire time that Misty was performing, Steve was strategically looking on from an adjoining room just in case he had to cool things down. He could have easily, most certainly, seen the guys she was dancing for, and these same guys were also occasionally and indiscreetly looking back at Steve, which just added another level of where the fuck is this going as they ramped up their frenetic signing. Steve was also close enough so that he could absolutely hear this group who were, she thought, getting too hot for her, while still also possibly just afraid enough of what Steve might do to them if they decided to rush her. But Misty kept dancing because she still felt safe because she still felt safe enough with Steve looking on. Yet, after a while, Misty began to get annoyed because the noisy signing group began to pay more attention to Steve in the other room than her. In fact, After a few dances, Misty noticed the men were hardly paying attention to Misty at all, even though it was her job to entertain them. Exasperated, she cut her performance down to only three songs because her talents seemed lost on her inattentive audience anyway. 
after her last ta-da, instead of claps and cheers and tips, which she was used to, the group quickly rushed Steve to get his autograph. It turns out the men had been signing to each other the whole time that Steve McMichael, the Chicago Bear, and the WWF wrestler was in their presence. The grunts that Misty had heard from the group were not for her. They were for Steve. From the group were not for her. They were for Steve. And autographs were signed, and the couple walked out of that man's home. Steve told Misty who he was, and she thought about that for a minute. And then she said, okay, after getting in the car, why don't I just keep my clothes on and you can just make us both money by going to your autograph signings or whatever you do? I think we'll make more money that way. And he just said, okay, let's do that. And that's when Misty quit stripping and started to prep herself for what she thought would become, for the rest of her life, a normal wife life. And eventually, she knew she would become a mother with that normal life. She did become a wife, when, and she was hardly normal, I have to say. And she became a mother, and a very good one, I have to say. But Steve was also on TV and invited, was friends with wild ex-athletes. Oh, and Steve had an ex-wife who was also a champion wrestler who married Steve's ex-best friend wrestling partner. And she had the public audacity to challenge Steve and uh, Misty to a celebrity couple's tag wrestling match, which Misty emphatically turned down. She appreciated that she had married a celebrity, and she accepted most of what went with it, including fans and cameras in her face and women throwing themselves at her husband. But it was hard, Misty admitted to me. But nothing could have prepared her for the ALS, and it made riding the roller coaster of celebrity life with Steve seem like a kiddie ride. Almost 30% of former NFL players end up with ALS, Alzheimer's disease, or dementia. And they are twice as likely to suffer, twice as likely to suffer from those diseases than the general population. The medical profession still has not decisively put down on paper that multiple concussions and the constant pounding and injuries that athletes take in Uh, uh, take on in contact sports injuries like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, Parkinson's disease, and CTE, but they will one day admit that there is a link. It was Misty um, who made Steve quit wrestling before there was even an ALS diagnosis. The years of practice, pounding, and injuries from his football career with the addition of the slamming and impact that was on his body that he sustained from wrestling began to take an accumulative toll on Steve's body. He was always sore, and more often than not, he was not feeling as invincible as he did when he was younger. Nor did he heal as quickly. Both Misty and Steve were aware that his body was wearing out, and Misty hounded him to stop while continually pointing out that he had a wife who wanted a kid who would need a father. Every time I had done Misty McMichael's hair, it was on one of her rare free days. And those free days consisted of not looking out for Steve, who was on a ventilator. Misty only allowed herself one free day a month when she would get her nails done or her hair done. And it was always on one of those free days that Misty may have given herself the gift of going to a show or a concert or a meetup with a girlfriend or two. But that was just one day a month. Misty also allowed herself to cry. She had her own crying room, which was really just the laundry room down at the far end of her house, away from Steve's bedroom. There's a little chair in there, and she would sneak into the crying room and sit down and cry, but only when the laundry was running so Steve or his nurses couldn't hear her. Also, when she was walking Blue, their beloved Chihuahua, sometimes she'd cry then too. 
The neighbors in her suburb of Chicago knew the McMichaels and her family situation. The neighbors would always wave or nod, and they always looked away when Misty's tears were flowing as her signature self-applied fake eyelashes slid down her face. 24-7 nursing care comes to about $13,000 a month. That's anywhere from a $150,000 to a $160,000 a year out-of-pocket expenditure. And when Missy first started to need a nurse for Steve, she and Steve were flat out broke. Pay the monthly mortgage on their home. They had already burned through their savings on all the medical bills that weren't covered by insurance. By the time Misty was head of the finances in her household, she didn't know how she was going to be able to put food on the table, let alone get Steve to the multiple doctor's appointments he had to get to. As Misty began struggling to pay the bills and put food on the table, she began to break down emotionally and physically. Misty's body reacted to her situation by giving her vertigo, brought on solely by the stress. For months, she experienced the room spinning, and there was a lot of puking until she was empty. And when she was empty and strong enough to get out of bed, she had to take care of Steve and their daughter. Misty's doctors told her there wasn't much that they could do for her except to prescribe Xanax, but that it was up to her to handle Xanax, but that it was up to her to handle her stress. Just don't stress, the doctors told Misty. Well, that was easier said than done because Misty has never been a zend out girl. She was an ex stripper married to a well, a manga, and she had never taken the time to learn how to meditate or anything like that. But help came, and it came to Misty in the form of three angels, Lori Demacos and Betsy Shepard, and they introduced Misty to Lizzie Nicholson, whose husband Tom Sullivan was suffering from dementia at the time. It was these three friends who took the time to help her, educate her, and even feed Misty and her family when they were financially devastated after only the first wave of Steve's impending medical care, which included their trip ups and follies from the family's insurance snafu, which included their trip ups and follies from the family's insurance snafus. They also helped Misty educate herself on how to manage and utilize health insurance because all ALS caretakers have to learn these skills or insurance won't pay out what it is expected to pay out. The first thing that the women did together was to produce a GoFundMe campaign, which allowed Misty and Steve to catch up on their mortgage just so they would be able to sell it and move to a place where they could install the proper retrofitting that someone with ALS needs to survive. Then they helped school Misty on how to get the proper insurance to be able to cover additional costs and supplies that she was going to need for Steve when he would inevitably lose more of his motor skills and functions. Her friends even patiently walked her through how to properly use the funds that had begun coming in from fundraisers produced by Steve's as well as his fans and the WWF. One of the most important things Lizzie Nicholson did for Misty was to lead her to a thing called Plan 88. Plan 88 was named after the number of NFL player John Mackey, who suffered from dementia. Then NFL is worth $44 billion and Plan 88 is the money they set aside to provide up to $144,000 in funds for in-home nursing care for former NFL players who suffer from dementia, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, Parkinson's disease, and CTE, which is a, which is a progressive brain condition that's thought to be caused by repeated blows to the head and repeated episodes of concussion. Lizzie taught Misty how to fill out the paperwork and file for the Plan 88 funds. It took a while to get the full amount from the NFL, but with Lizzie's help, Misty finally got it. Lizzie recently lost her husband but she also successfully lobbied the U.S. government to help get the older retired football players' pensions raised. Lizzie Nicholson was not only one of Misty's angels, she was also a hero and a soldier. 
Lori, Betsy, and Lizzie held Misty together when she felt like she was losing her mind, when she was losing her home. The three women worked on Misty, and they worked with Misty and told her that everything was going to be all right at a time when Misty thought all was lost. Eventually, Misty began to take her friend's prescribed free days, and she learned to arrest the financial bleeding with the help of public support from C's fans. More importantly, Misty began to believe that things were going to be all right. Misty told me that she would never have been able to receive and manage the outpouring of all the gifts of love and financial support for Steve, not have gotten in touch with her inner strength if they hadn't shown her how to help herself. In fact, Misty claims that Lori, Betsy, and Lizzie saved her life and that they changed her for the better. After I let go of my tears, she said, I thank the universe for friends like them, and I hope that I can be for Steve like Lizzie was for her husband. As of this writing, Misty was still working hard every day for her own family, and yet she knows she has been gifted a lot of support and gifts, and that there's people out there like herself who are walking into a life with ALS. So she began trying to be available to help other families and patients suffering from the horrible financial effects brought on by ALS. ALS is one of those diseases that doesn't just creep up on you and then you get to pick up a brochure or go to one of the doctors to get all of the information you'll need. Misty says she was gobsmacked with all the things she didn't know about how to care for her husband. And at first, she didn't know where to get the information because the needs for each ALS patient are so different. You have to do your research, she says, and you'll have to learn what meds go with other meds, and you have to know how to financially manage your life as well as the lives of the people you need to protect. And you have to know all of this information before you actually need it. Take, for instance, wipes and ventilator tubes. If your ALS patient ends up on a ventilator, like Steve was on, you're going to need a million of these two items. One can try and get Medicare to pay for those things, but Medicare doesn't like to pay for some necessities. So you'll have to have the funds or savings to pay out of plater tubes on your own. Of course, there will be other supplies you'll need that cost a fortune at the medical supply store, but they may be cheaper on Amazon. There are supplies such as um, split gauze that you'll need, but they are only available at a medical supply store. And some of those stores won't take your insurance. Steve's milk that Misty feeds him through his feeding tube costs $900 per month. Steve also needed various other supplies that amounted to thousands of dollars per month. Just one of his prescriptions was $3,000 per month. Steve had a hole in his throat for his tracheotomy, and he also had a hole in his belly for his feeding tube, as well as a hole in his side for a colostomy tube, you know, the doo-doo drainage. All of these tubes had to be attended to every day. There is a tube called the every day. There is a tube called the inner cannula, and it's an inner tube inserted within the main outer cannula of the tracheotomy tube. That tube helped Steve's breathing, and that tube had to be changed every day. The old ones Misty used to use were solid, cleanable, and reusable. Misty was happy with the old ones, but the doctors and the nurses in the hospitals kept saying that the new disposable ones were better. Additionally, the manufacturer of the tubes was going to stop making the old ones anyway. Misty was like, Ugh, who cares? She already had three of the old tubes that she could just keep reusing and cleaning. But the nurses and the doctors in the hospitals kept telling her to switch. So she relented and she switched to the new disposable devices. After all, the nurses and doctors were supposed to know what was best. Doctors were supposed to know what was best. But after she upgraded, Misty had to change those disposable tubes three or four times a day, and the insurance would only pay for one of them per day. 
So Misty ended up paying for a fortune for those new and improved tubes out of pocket every single month. But she learned a valuable lesson. What the medical professionals recommend may not always be practical or what is best. Best for her, the caretaker, or the ALS patient. When I was doing Misty's hair, making her blonder and blonder, I always listened I always listened in when she took the calls from Steve's doctors or nurses. Her quote unquote free days were always about fielding calls. I was in awe of how much she knew about the different meds and the technical procedures that Steve was going through at all times. Misty had clear and precise information that she was equally exchanging with her medical professionals so that they could all properly care for Steve's well-being. I once joked that she was practically a doctor or a nurse herself because of how impressive her knowledge was. And she said, I know a lot of shit that I don't think I would ever know, but I am a wife. And that's just as important as a nurse or a doctor when your husband has ALS. But I would never devalue the nurses who have helped me in my home by saying that I feel as if I'm a nurse or a doctor. And when she said that statement, I knew I was going to write something about her or I was going to do something. And this is the something. You can go to mafiahairdresser.com and see the blog on her. It's a little bit more detailed than what I'm telling you now. Anyway, Misty says people um, came around much, much more when Steve, Steve was around much, much more when Steve, Steve was healthier and more able to communicate. But Misty, over time, had to keep the traffic to a minimum. Um, it was way too much for Steve, even though the visits used to be uplifting and mentally good for him to take visitors. Misty felt bad for the visitors because by showing them Steve, it also showed them um, if something like this could happen to the strongest man in the world, it could certainly happen to anyone. She thought it was a startling, bitter taste of mortality, and yet Misty didn't think it was such a bad thing for people to see Steve when she still allowed visitors. She wished for people to be thankful for what they had. And more recently, if a scheduled visitor hadn't seen Steve for a long time, and sometimes even if they had, they might have been in for a big shock. Misty has refused a few friends to see Steve uh, recently. And one time there were two dancer girlfriends of Misty's who see Steve. And as Misty prepared them, the girls remembered the good old days when they used to sit around at one of their house parties and Steve would whip out and put on a G-string and mimic one of their male stripper friends dance moves for them. And Steve was always so comfortable in his body and he was so funny, which was his sexy. And then the girls began to cry when they reminisced. Well, Misty would have none of that crying shit, as she put it. So she thanked the girls for coming, but then sent them on their way without seeing Steve at all. Misty McMichael has woken up every day for over the last three, well, now it's four years, oh my gosh, thinking about how to make Steve as comfortable as she could. She has done her best to make sure he felt the love from herself and his family, as well as fans and friends. And she worked hard to educate herself medically so that she could properly care for her husband and not accidentally kill him, drug him so much that he hallucinated instead of dream when he was asleep. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that ALS patients are in so many meds and sometimes doctors don't exactly communicate with each other. So it's up to the caretaker to make sure what drugs go with what in that person's body. Misty knew it would be hard to remember what it was like not to be his caretaker when he passed. But she certainly didn't want to remember him or them as a couple that way. She told me she didn't know what or who she would, she would become when she was no longer acting as his wife, the caretaker, but she has never wanted him to leave. She always wanted him to stay a while longer for her and for their daughter. She wanted him to stay alive so he could keep dreaming, dreaming of their fun, crazy, not normal life together. You can't dream, dream when you're dead, Misty told me. So that's something to live for, isn't it? Misty's original wish came true when she wished for a man that would take care of her as well as a husband who she could take care of. 
Only wishes and prayers rarely happen as simply as you originally envisioned them. This wish was bigger, so much bigger. Her life was not a dream, but it certainly became a mission. And she may have found what she will do long after Steve is gone. She's already doing it. She helps others affected by ALS by connecting them with the Lou Gehrig's Foundation and the ALS Foundation, as well as donating some of the money her husband's fans sent her. She has helped out other ALS patients get to doctor appointments and to stay alive with that money. And she is just a wife, and she is fierce and focused, and she keeps company with other angels. She cusses a lot, and I think she needs to learn how to meditate and properly use email and the computer. I hope she finds the time, maybe on one of her free days in the future. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.